Okay. Oh. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are ready to begin. Oh, that's better. Hi. A um, bit of housekeeping to start with. Oh, my name is Dr. Adi James, Associate Professor at the University of South Australia. So for housekeeping, emergency exits, one at the back there, two at the front here. Uh, the toilets are where you came in, down, just down that corridor and to the right. If you have your phones, if you could switch them to silent, uh, but sit there and tweet all the events and what's going on, if you wish, that would be great. Uh, in gathering here today, we acknowledge the Ghana people, who are the traditional custodians of the land. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people present. So, welcome. Uh, welcome to Darkness Visible Down Under. Uh, this is the third in Asta Ross and Sir Keith Smith's Fund, Space in, uh, Space in the Community Lecture Series. This event is part of the public outreach associated with the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program a five-week intensive multidisciplinary space studies program conducted by the University of South Australia in partnership with the International Space University. And the participants on that program are all here in the audience. Uh, you can tell which ones they are. <laughs> um, I'm very honored to introduce and welcome uh, to you uh, tonight's guest speaker. Uh, Professor Alan Duffy is program lead for the Space Tech Applications at Swinburne's Data Science Research Institute and an astrophysicist. And as part of that research, Alan creates baby universes on the nation's most powerful supercomputers to understand how galaxies, like our Milky Way, form and evolve within vast halos of invisible dark matter that binds them all together. And in his research and his research group are attempting to find this dark matter as part of SABRE, which is the world's first dark matter detector in the southern hemisphere. And when he's not exploring a simulated universe, uh, you can find him trying to explain our universe as a regular on the ABC Breakfast TV, TENS The Project, and ABC Triple J's Hack. So, with no more further ado, I shall welcome Professor Alan Duffy. Thank you, Alan. so much. Okay, I, I'm going to walk around, by the way, so my apologies to the camera guy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You'd be horrified at the symbol, sign he just made just then. Terrible. Uh, yes, my name is Alan Duffy. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. That is dark matter. This is a mysterious component of our universe that I have devoted at least, wow, decade, 15 years now, studying in a variety of manners. I'm going to try to explain some of those techniques to you all. Uh, I am cognizant of the range of audience. I have literally the space agency staring at me. I have NASA <laughs> looking at me. Um, I have all of the international uh, uh, space university attendees, and I have the um, incredible uh, general public of Adelaide. So, <laughs> thank you all for coming. So, I'm going to start uh, a little slower than some of the audience might uh, be used to, but we'll all get to the, uh, the end point together. So, before I talk about all things dark matter, which is to say uh, invisible, I thought we should maybe start uh, a bit more gently and go from the visible universe. Now, I, maybe we'll drop the lights a little bit that are reflecting onto this if we can uh, on the slides. Um, but in any case, who knows what this is? Okay, I was going to not listen to the NASA <laughs> research scientists. <laughs> be horrendous if they didn't know. Anyone else? Du yeah, there's dust. Is anyone more specific? What are these? This is, this is, right, okay, well, star forming region, we'll say, I was going for stars, but star forming region, awesome. Indeed, this is a, these are newly formed stars, uh, OB stars, these bright blue 
uh, blue hot is the hottest. So we think talk about red hot. <laughs> blue hot is the hottest um, color. If you get any hotter as a black body radiator, you will shine in the ultraviolet, which is bluer than blue, as it were. So these are hot young stars from the force of their uh, uh, light, indeed, and, and emission. They have blasted apart the cocoon of cold, dark gas and dust that gave birth to them like any good newborn does. They destroyed their crèche. We then have them revealed to us um, in this Hubble Space Telescope image. So thanks, NASA. If we zoom out, what do we see? Galaxy. That's it. Yeah, this is, seriously, everyone should feel empowered to answer. These are, uh, there's no wrong answers. This is a, um, an edge-on uh, disk. We're actually not too dissimilar to something like the Milky Way, and we're seeing it edge-on, so the, see these dust lanes. So this material, essentially, that blocks the starlight from uh, billions of stars, so many stars indeed, that all of that light becomes a nice, diffuse glow. Indeed, this kind of dark uh, obscuration is familiar to all of us down under, where we can see that dark band in the Milky Way. Now, if we continue to zoom out and we focus our attention, indeed, the Hubble Space Telescope's attention, we open the shutter and we leave it for a million seconds in an area about the size of the thumbnail held outstretched on sky, this image becomes clear. And every single point of light is now an entire galaxy, some indeed larger than our own. In that tiny patch of the sky, there are some 10,000 galaxies, all of which have billions of stars and just as much material, if not more, in atoms and gas that lies between those stars. If you add up all of this stuff, it is clear there's a lot of stuff in the universe. And yet I'm going to say, hopefully convince you tonight, that there exists five times more of an invisible new type of stuff than all of those atoms and all of those stars and clouds of gas and all of those galaxies combined, and indeed even more in the entire visible universe itself. Five times more of this new stuff. Anyone skeptical yet? No? Okay. So you're going to help me in this project. Because right now, this stuff, this dark matter, that outweighs everything we can see five times over, is blowing through you a wind of hundreds of thousands of kilometers uh, per hour, or kilometers per second, I should say, sorry. Hundreds of kilometers per second coming from just there, in fact, that side of the auditorium. So, you're going to help me catch it. Could you make the OK symbol with one hand? Uh, about, you know, about an inch for the Americans, a couple of centimeters for the rest of the world. <laughs> and if you turn in that direction, and then I want you to stop it and block it, and then I want you all to count from five. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, now who caught one? Who caught a particle? Anyone catch any? You caught one, you reckon? You reckon you caught one? Possibly, possibly. Okay. You should have. You really should have, because in that time, half a billion dark matter particles have just passed through that little gap. And you blocked it with your hand, right? Can you stop it? OK. So I think it's unlikely that any of us actually caught a dark matter particle. Numerous as they are, hurricane-esque winds as they are. But don't worry, you'll get another chance later. 
So, why do we think that the dark matter is there? This incredible idea that the universe is filled with this seemingly invisible material that's passing through us right now. Well, one of the pioneers in this study is uh, the noted uh, American astronomer Vera Rubin. He just named the LSST telescope after, I believe. Renamed to the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is wonderful. Uh, and in this, she used a very simple physics principle to essentially weigh galaxies. And I would like a volunteer to help me demonstrate this physics principle. Have got anyone keen for a physics experiment? You have to come to the front. Uh, no maths is, is involved, or do you need much maths? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, come to the front. All right. Oh, wait. No, no, we got, we got a volunteer. Brave man. Round of applause. <laughs> All right. Your name? Paul. Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, this, is, uh, this is not my dog's chew toy uh, tonight. It is normally, of course. This is a, a finely tuned physics experiment. Uh, if you could uh, essentially just rotate it around like that for me. Start off nice and short string, as it were. All right, so we'll just gently rotate around. So what Paul's demonstrating is with a, uh, a little bit of force required to hold on to that toy, so that's all right, you can make this nice circular motion. Now, can you speed it up for me? All right, and go a little faster. Is there more force or less force required to hold on? More force. More force. OK, wonderful. Now could you, uh, you can slow it back down. And now lengthen out the string. We'll get that orbit nice and, and long, that radius. And now, speed up for me. All right, are we is it more force or less force to make this orbit fast at longer distances? More or less? Feels more. Feels more. Wonderful. All right. And what happens when you remove the force holding on to the toy? Come on, speed up. Really, really go. And what happens when you remove the force holding on to it? <laughs> That's why it's a soft toy. Let go. Let go. Oh, all right, there we go. So it flew away. And we'll just demo this to see the motion. And if it goes really, really fast, lots of force required to hold on. And we let that force go. Off it goes when the force is no longer sufficient to hold on to it. Would you please thank Paul for that demo? OK. So what we've learned is something, if there is a uh, force holding on to an object, it will go around in a circle. The faster you see that object moving, the more force is required to hold on to it. The faster it's moving and the longer the radius, the orbit, even more force required. And if that force is not there, off it shoots. Simple. So, what do we have in space? We don't have two toys that we know of. We have stars. So, and indeed clouds of gas, all going around a galaxy. So, Vera Rubin went to measure those speeds, and she measured the speeds of the star and, and, and other objects moving in clouds of gas at different distances from the center, increasing distances. Now, there is no strings in space, unless you're a cosmologist and you love cosmic strings as a model, but forget that. It's a terrible, it's not even really a joke, actually. Um, there are, of course, only, in terms of gravitation, uh, forces, gravity. So, our expectation is that these stars would be going around, held in place, just as the string would, by the gravity. And since the brightness is all concentrated in the center so of, of all those stars, so too is the mass. So the expectation is, as you go further and further out, you would need, uh, essentially, more force to hold on to those objects ever more distant. So the expectation was, since we know where all the mass is, you're getting further away, gravity's getting weaker, essentially the fast-moving stuff just can't be held on. Essentially, there's just not enough force to hold on those fast-moving outer stars. Well, that's what was expected. And this, in fact, is what was seen. So we have the speed as a function of distance. The fastest-moving stuff 
was in fact the stuff that was the furthest away. It is the situation where the, the toy, the end of the string, as far as long a string as possible, is going as fast as possible, enormous force required. But I've just said all of the gravity, the force that is available, it gets weaker as you go away from all of the mass in the center of the galaxy, at least the mass that you can see. This discrepancy requires about five times more mass than everything you can see to hold on to those fast-moving stars, to stop the chew toy from flying away. To call it a surprise would be an understatement. But Beer Rubin and many astro astronomers since have measured, indeed, this same picture over and over again. You can plug in the numbers uh, to work out the actual mass required. For Beer's work, and indeed uh, many of the other works, it's not just enough to have that mat, that much extra mass, but in fact the mass has to be spread very smoothly beyond the galaxy itself, in fact, and, and certainly there's a visible reason in the, in the center, because just how nicely sloped and smooth that profile of the fast-moving stars and indeed other clouds of gas beyond, in fact, is. What we uncovered was the motion of these stars and clouds of gas, the stuff we can see, being pulled by the gravity of an unseen partner, and then allowing us to map out that partner to great extents, showing us that the galaxy was embedded within a cloud of this otherwise invisible material. That was the main clue. Well, we're about to turbocharge this endeavor in Australia. And this is, forgive uh, the Australia-centric nature of this uh, talk to my international guests. There are wonderful telescopes all around the world who will be doing similar efforts. But in Australia, we have the Square Kilometre Array centered in Western Australia. The 1% version, uh, the prototype, the Australian SK Pathfinder, the reason I actually came to Australia a decade ago, is finally complete. 36 of these beautiful uh, dishes looking out into the sky, usually at the same thing. That was just a nice uh, photo op that we tilted them around. And those radio telescopes will be able to perform the efforts of Vera, not just on one galaxy, but on hundreds of thousands, mapping out the speed of the galaxies and hence their mass and hence the dark matter. But we can do more when we go and create these computer simulations, these baby universes um, that was described earlier. Uh, the simulations predict that we have a structure to the universe. Is that going to play? No. It very much is invisible. All right. No, yeah, media not find. Oh, rats. Okay, didn't make it across when we copied it. Okay, um, this is unfortunate because this is actually my research. Okay, cool. <laughs> so in these um, numerical laboratories, these supercomputers, we start the universe just after the Big Bang. Everything's smooth and boring. There is gas, the atoms that you and I are made of, the stars, and then there is dark matter, this extra ingredient you have to add. And you have to add it to provide the gravitational backbone around which the galaxies themselves grow. If you don't put it into the simulation, you actually get, don't get galaxies by the present day. What we find is that the galaxies lie, end up lying along long uh, uh, filaments, or almost a spider's web of this dark matter that stretches across the universe. And the galaxies are like morning dew along the spider web in your backyard. We can compare the, predict the predictions from these computer simulations, these model universes, with what we observe with the Australian Square Kilometre Pathfinder. And that comparison I predicted uh, <laughs> nearly a decade ago, and now it's finally time to see how badly I got that prediction wrong. It is a very nervous time for me, knowing I'm finally going to be tested. No theorist ever wants to actually really get the data, because then you might be wrong. And we'll see. Are the galaxies distributed in the universe along a spiderweb-like 
cosmic filament as the simulations predict. We'll find out in the next year or two. Now, spoiler, they do. They definitely do. Other telescopes have shown this. So, we can go beyond just weighing galaxies and unveiling their, their hidden component of mass. Again, uh, this is a NASA um, uh, image, an effort to map out the dark matter. And this is an actual picture of the dark matter as revealed, once again, not through its light, it doesn't shine or absorb light, but through its impact on what we can see, its gravitational impact on what we can see. Essentially, it is bending light around itself, this vast amount of dark matter on intergalactic scales. So I'll explain this plot, this, this image, in a little bit. This is an experiment we can't do right now, because this is a non-alcohol uh, venue. This actually doesn't work if you have alcohol in the glass anyway, so um, maybe we could have done this experiment now. But when you're at home, and in responsible amounts, please do this experiment. You get out a glass, a wine glass, you make a large dot on a piece of paper, and that's what a large dot on a piece of paper looks like. Uh, this is not your fancy Riddell wine glasses, by the way. This is the old school wine glasses. It needs a stem. Because Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that large amount of mass will bend light around itself. And that bending, that distortion, uh, curiously, is reproduced by the stem of a wine glass. We call this lensing. And we're going to see it happen. So in this experiment, we'll put the wine glass over the dot. And now I've got a video. Oh my goodness, I hope that video copied across. Yay! And now we're looking down the wine glass stem, and we're looking around. I don't know what's happening here. But basically, that dot, the shape is changing as we look around the wine glass. And that, essentially, when we look directly down, there it is. I'll move um, uh, the wine glass to reveal the dot on the piece of paper. I hope you all paid attention to what happened to the shape of that circular dot, depending on how we looked through the wine glass. So can anyone tell me what happens when you're directly in line? You looking directly down the wine glass to the spot. What happened to the spot on the paper? Some, some say nothing. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing, the, I'm seeing lots of this stuff. Okay, circular shapes, all right. This, so there's the dot. You can look directly down through the stem of the wine glass, that's true. But all around the edge, the image is distorted. We get a near perfect circle. Uh, uh, this lensing effect is, well, very clear in this geometry where we have ourselves looking directly uh, down in line with the mass. Remember, Einstein tells us that gravity should lens in an analogous way to this wine glass. So, do we see these kind of optical illusions? Well, you go out, you look with something like the Hubble Space Telescope, and then that's what you see. Here we have the stem of the wine glass is a, an enormous uh, uh, galaxy, an elliptical. Its enormous amount of material and mass is bending the background image or the, uh, of a, sorry, the image of a background galaxy into this near perfect circle. This is a blue spiral. It's very similar uh, to our Milky Way. It's almost perfectly face on. It should be the blue circle. But because of the gravity of this intervening galaxy, just like the stem of the wine glass, it bends it around in a near perfect circle. And the more mass you have, the greater that uh, bending effect becomes. A similar way, the, the thicker the stem of the wine glass, essentially, the larger the, um, the uh, well, circumference, but the, the radius of this circle would be. It's called an Einstein ring when you have a perfect alignment between the Hubble Space Telescope, the intervening galaxy, and a background object. Now, you can imagine that's fairly uncommon alignment. It's far more likely that you'll see something off, off axis, as it were, at a skew. So what do you see when you look down the wine glass? 
and it was slightly off angle. You can show that, oh, I can't actually hear it. Oh, like, what? An arc, okay. Right, so, a, yeah, so part of an arc. Is there anything else? Yeah, Swiss circle. Um, any advances, Swiss circle, arc? All right, never actually get this, okay, all right. Yeah, you get this arc, a squished circle, right? But I hope you know it, you get a secondary. No one ever sees that, love it, it's great. Did you see it? Okay. So, we have a very thin arclet, where you look just off the side. So, this is what our wine glass experiment uh, shows us. We go looking in the universe, do we see it? Yes, we do, there's one thick arc, and there's the arclet, but in this case, we don't have a single galaxy. It's a cluster of galaxies, one of the largest structures in the universe. This cluster of galaxies, this is akin to having many, many wine glass stems nestled next to one another, and you mess up the, you distort the picture. So actually, there's uh, about half a dozen, at least, arcs in this image. Here's one, here's a little one, here, here, here. Using this lensing, so-called strong gravitational lensing, you can actually see the invisible dark matter through, directly through its gravitational effects. This kind of information tells you exactly where the dark matter is to create these bends. You need powerful supercomputers to use all of the possible options and combinations to create that map. But it's one of the most powerful techniques we have to reveal the otherwise invisible dark matter. And the key is that we don't see enough material to bend the light in this way from just the visible. It, it's similar to the rotation experiment. We are dragged, kicking and screaming to this incredible idea that there is an invisible component to all of these objects. Now, I, this is the animation that essentially explains how this um, lensing effect occurs. And it's lens because the light is passing through curved space-time. Essentially, the mass of the, um, the cluster of galaxies, or indeed any massive object, curves the background of space-time. And light rays are traveling straight. They just happen to travel straight through curved space. And this is your lens. It's a null geodesic, essentially, is the path they follow. Don't worry, that's not important. <laughs> I don't know why I showed off. OK. So this then explains how one can create a map that I showed just a little while ago between the Earth and um, some background objects. We have intervening structures of galaxies and their associated dark matter. All the way to us, that light is being bent and distorted by the, uh, the lensing effect of all of that material, and that reveals the, um, the dark matter that surrounds it. I've taken some artistic license. This is technically a weak lensing image, but the analogy stands. In other words, we can map out, directly see the invisible. There's a very exciting potential explanation of dark matter, by the way. I hope some of you had thought of it already. If it's invisible, it doesn't shine uh, light. Uh, it doesn't reveal itself through light, but it has mass, it could be that the dark matter is in fact comprised of black holes. Countless tiny black holes formed at the very earliest moments of our universe. It's a ripper of an idea. It's Stephen Hawking, so it should be. These primordial black holes would reveal themselves as they pass between us and a background star, causing that lensing. But so small are the black holes that essentially you would just see a star brighten and fade. It's an idea that's been around for a while, um, and I had the distinct opportunity uh, and, and pleasure to go to the Blanco uh, telescope. So this is in Chile. Uh, it was about a week after the riots, um, uh, and thankfully, you know, it was, it was all safe and happy at that point. But we had this stunning four meter, and there I am, uh, obligatory uh, observer photo, and um, I think they'll let me back. I don't think I stuffed it up that badly, but it was extremely nerve wracking because this is a very um, expensive instrument. I pr personally was there not just for the science, but for the coffee with that view. <laughs> right, so that's pretty good looking out in the Andes. 
So we were actually doing something special then. This is ongoing research. I actually can't talk anything more about it because the data has just arrived back. We're processing it. We're trying to look for the flickering of stars, as it were, from these intervening black holes that may explain the dark matter. That's one theory of what the dark matter could be. The vastly more popular one is that it could be a particle. It could be something that weighs perhaps 100 times the mass of a proton. So for you chemists out there, something similar to iodine, say, in mass. Now, I did say you would have a second go at catching that particle. By the way, that was the kind of particle you were trying to capture that you all failed so woefully to do earlier. Congratulations, however, because one of you statistically have caught one in the last 30 minutes. There's enough bodies here presenting targets that a wind of dark matter that rushes through you, countless billions of these particles, one of your atoms may have been knocked out of your body through that collision with the dark matter. Did anyone feel it? If you did, it was probably indigestion. You really, you're fine. There's, you have many atoms. It's, it would be very unlikely to notice it. But that's because we make for very poor dark matter detectors. But fortunately, we're building a better one. So this is um, a sodium iodine crystal uh, doped with thallium. The idea is a dark matter particle will come along. Uh, it will collide with the nucleus the, of, of that atom, the iodine in particular. Um, and in the recoil, it will cause a flash of light. And the thallium is there to take it into the visible. Quite literally, a crystal, as you look at it, would glow when struck by dark matter. This is, going, is being watched by two very careful, uh, very precise uh, cameras, essentially, these, these photomultiplier tubes, and they're all going into a large vessel. This is a project called SABER. Uh, it's an international collaboration. It's led out of the University of Melbourne by Professor Elisabetta Barbario. It involves teams from um, uh, Princeton, uh, University of Adelaide, can we, can we give them a boo as locals? You're UniSA, right? Is that not okay. um, they're great people. Uh, and then uh, collaborators in ANU, UWA, uh, uh, Swinburne, uh, University of Melbourne, of course, and um, University of Sydney. And we have all formed now a center of excellence to further explore these technologies. But the idea is very simple. We will look for this crystal to glow when struck by dark matter, this constant flux that passes through us. Immediately, you might imagine, where would you build such a detector? Right, this thing is going to glow when struck. So that might present a challenge. Can anyone guess where do you build this thing? Underground, why? You didn't realize there was a follow-up question. To, br to block out the other particles. Yeah. So we have uh, every day, indeed every second of our lives, a um, constant collisions from uh, cosmic rays, essentially highly Char, uh, highly energetic particles, uh, exploding, black, uh, exploding stars, feeding black holes, uh, the sun itself, cause a, uh, a constant torrent of these highly damaging, highly penetrating particles that collide with the Earth's surface and us as well. Our body repairs the damage is fine in the main. But to our detector, that would just be blindingly bright. So we have to take it underground so we go over a kilometer underground and let all of that material, all of that rock, block those cosmic rays. And there, deep underground, you place your detector. And this is an example of a UK-based one. Then the question becomes, what do you build your detector out of? Is anyone worried about? I mean, I guess let's flip that question around. What do you have to worry about when you're building this detector. You had no other, other people answering. I have a feeling of a physics degree. Can I get background radiation? Right. And, and anything like, where is this radiation coming from? Center of the Earth. Very good. Yes. There's another source. Us, why? Who said that? Why us? What have we done? Oh, yeah. Oh, we are naturally radioactive. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a low-level radiation at all times. If you eat a banana, for example, the 
potassium-40 in the bananas are, are actually a pain for us. So no bananas in our labs. It's not actually a joke. Um, no one else? I feel, like, I feel like Americans here should be like a little shifty looking, no? Yes, ball out, that's right, because we detonated do countless dozens of nuclear bombs on Earth. And unfortunately, that fallout um, by these nuclear tests, including the USSR, to be fair, and others, um, that has coated the surface of the Earth with a, um, a low-level amount of radiation. There are other natural sources as well. In other words, there's just a lot of background radiation. And if you build a detector out of that material that's so contaminated, you'll just be blinded by it. You will see the glow from your own equipment, as it were. So you have to source very pure, very pristine materials. And in fact, some of these experiments have gone so far as to find metal that has been shielded uh, uh, from uh, nuclear fallout since 1945, uh, finding old ships that were sunk before World War II. And that's good metal. It's good steel. You can build a detector out of it. And it's also been deep under, underwater, so protected from that fallout. And in particular, the um, German scuttled fleet from World War I in Scapa Flow in the UK is a great source for this. But why would you build it in Australia, this detector? Well, it's because our galaxy goes around uh, once every 250 million years or so. It's going through this cloud of dark matter that holds it together. So that's that wind, and it's in that direction of Cygnus. So that's literally the direction that we are moving right now through our galaxy. So we see this wind of dark matter. But we are, of course, not on the sun. We are on Earth. And for half of the year, the Earth goes around the sun in that direction. And but for half of the year, we go in the opposite direction. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll do the frame transformation here. Here we are on the Earth. And now, we're zooming through in the northern hemisphere summer. We move in the same direction as the sun, so the wind increases in strength. And then, for the, other, um, for the winter time, essentially, in, in the northern hemisphere, that wind seems to slow down. So it seems to gust. This wind of dark matter that goes through us right now. And it does so um, up and down across the course of a year in a very predictable way, because that is literally our motion around the sun as the sun itself goes through the cloud of dark matter around our galaxy. And that's the key for why you might want to build a detector in the southern hemisphere. Because what else changes through the course of a year? Seasons. So you can't tell. Maybe your detector is changing because the seasons have changed. What's the easiest way to test that theory? Go to the other side of the Earth, and the seasons are six months out of phase. Their summers are winter and vice versa. Uh, just in case there's flat earthers, you are here. Uh, and all the northern hemisphere detectors are over there. Because this dark matter, is a ghost, essentially able to travel through the Earth without um, uh, any trouble, except for the occasional collision we hope with you know, atoms like our detector. It means that if you see an increased signal in the Northern Hemisphere, we should see it at the same time. And if you see it uh, decrease then in wintertime, we should also see it decrease. But for us, it's summer. So we're perfectly out of sync in terms of seasons. We should be seeing the same signal growing and falling as that wind grows and falls the course of a year if it is, in fact, the dark matter. So it's a beautiful experiment. It's very simple in that uh, design. This is, <laughs> OK. Uh, so this is, um, just in case no one know, uh, you don't know what stall looks like, that stall, it's a gold mine town in Victoria. And there's the mine. We have gone, it's an active coal mine, so it's quite exciting when you go there. Um, and it's being, as I said, led by at uh, the University of Melbourne's Elisabetta Barbario. And that's what the mine site looked like when we took a tour. Uh, this, you can, well, you can tell that we're not miners, or like real working miners for a start, because some of us are in an actual three-piece suit. Um, and it was about 35 degrees and 100% humidity down there. It was really quite unbelievably uh, uncomfortable. 
um, and th this is my colleague from Swimmer and Jeremy Wald. Uh, the idea is that we will, indeed we have, sorry, excavated this cavern into a large underground laboratory, a national facility. The fit out is occurring as we speak. And then hopefully later in the year, we will put the dark matter detector down and start to look for this, um, this dark matter. And again, I just have to summarize. Astronomy has led us to the incredible startling revelation that this dark matter is surrounding us right now, that indeed our motion through it is what allows us to be so certain of this constant wind of dark matter. You build these detectors, and indeed there are dozens of, of these across all different types, looking for all different types of dark matter, and they're all engaged in a very similar activity, and that is we take, we spend years of our life, millions of dollars building a detector in our case, a crystal that we will take to the bottom of an active gold mine, and there in the dark, we will wait for it to glow when struck by a ghost. And if you don't think that sounds cool, you've got no soul. But this is the frontier of a new field that we call astroparticle physics. It combines astronomy, it combines particle physics, working together with nuclear engineer um, scientists and engineers more generally to make these extraordinary machines possible. It is the growth area because we have this underground lab, these experiments. I would ask the younger generation in particular to consider physics, to explore these opportunities to be part of a search for dark matter. And if you're part of a team that does discover dark matter, you will have explained five times more of the universe than all of astronomy to this moment. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, we have uh, time for questions from the audience. There's a couple of roving microphones if you could wait for them to come down. So oh, good. We'll, the NASA chief scientist. We'll start with the <laughs> NASA chief scientist, Jim. Because <laughs> it'll be an easy one. <laughs> so have we found any galaxies that we can say don't have dark matter. Right. So uh, we have found varying amounts of dark matter that is required. Within the error bars, you might squint and say that some seem to have no dark matter, but it becomes extraordinarily uh, complex to model those kind of systems. They have low numbers of stars and the like. But actually, that paradoxically is the greatest proof that we have that dark matter is, in fact, the answer to this. Because remember, everything I've said, by the way, is gravity, right? The lensing, the rotation, it's all assuming Einstein is right. What if he's wrong? What if the reason that the stars are moving uh, uh, so quickly for the apparent amount of material that we can see, is the gravity of that material, maybe gravity just behaves differently. Maybe it's, it's strong enough at those large distances. And we're seeing a change in gravity's behavior. It's called modified gravity uh, theories, MOND in particular. If that were the case, then we should see that exact effect in all of these places that we look. The fact that sometimes we see there's actually no need for dark matter, or at least a low amount of it, belies the fact that gravity can be wrong. It should, be, it should give you that signal everywhere you look. It's the fact that it changes, it's so messy, that gives us confidence that it is the dark matter. And the dark matter is an active part of that formation. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an exciting field because as I said, we have all these theories of what the dark matter could be. But really in the last five years since the bullet cluster uh, uh, experiment in particular, um, we've been very much convinced that it is in fact um, uh, dark matter. And I'll explain that uh, maybe if we have time later. It's, it's a little more involved as an experiment. Yeah, I, I don't know where I'm going. Yeah, if you've got a microphone, by the way, speak. <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, I don't know how to turn this microphone on. Is it on? Right. Yeah, sorry. I've got two questions. One is uh, if there's five times more matter in the universe that, than we first thought, wouldn't that be slowing the universe's expansion down? Mm -hmm. And the other question is uh, here on Earth, we do classical measurements of force and gravity, yep. and we're confident that we know the force of gravity. But with five times more stuff around, 
why aren't our scales showing funny readings? Yep, okay. Uh, we'll answer that in the opposite way around, as in you'll answer that. What was the, so what's the answer? Why aren't our scales fluctuating on Earth? Yeah, it's moving past. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's also because locally speaking, it's incredibly low density. Uh, I mean, it sounds great that, uh, sounds great. It sounds impressive that there's, you know, a billion particles per second, or, you know, you pick your number going through us. But there's a trillion, trillion, plus some other zeros, I can't even remember now, of atoms in your body. I mean, that's a fantastically low number. It's just that space is very big. So you have a low density of the dark matter sprinkled more or less uniformly, this cloud. It's only because you travel for tens of thousands of, of light years and it's still there adding up while the stars are all clustered in the center that you actually begin to build up a measurable impact, right? And that's why we've only relatively recently noticed its presence. Even on the scale of between stars, the impact of the dark matter is not sufficient to significantly move them around in that fluctuation way that would reveal its presence. Um, the first question was, uh, sorry, I've just forgotten which way. Uh, it was, um, uh, gosh, I'm completely blank. What was your first? Oh, yes, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, right, yes, absolutely. So uh, if you have all of this, this mass, it will and does slow the universe's expansion. Because of something called dark energy about seven billion years ago, uh, the expansion, in fact, was slowing until that point. And then um, an astronomer by the name of Brian Schmidt, uh, otherwise known as the vice chancellor of the ANU uh, today, uh, with, with colleagues, Saul uh, Perlmutter and Adam Reese, and others uh, using Mount uh, Stromlo, oh, sorry, using Australian telescopes in particular, they discovered the expansion of the universe and they revealed that it was, in fact, speeding up. Which is, which is a shock, by the way. But the simple fact, they were looking for the measurement of the slowing of the universe's expansion because it was being pulled on by all the gravity of this dark matter. And we've seen that that was, in fact, the case for about half the universe's life. It's just that as the universe expands, matter dilutes, but this dark energy doesn't and eventually overcomes. I expect I'm going to get a question about dark energy soon. But in the faint hopes that I don't, I'm going to continue with this. Um, the idea is using the expansion of the universe, and in particular, the cosmic microwave background, you get that perfect ratio of the atoms to the dark matter. So I haven't even mentioned that. That's the gold standard of dark matter. It's just not as fun because you can't use a chew toy um, to demonstrate that effect. But yes, its gravity has been there all along. Yep, I, well, whoever's got the microphone, it's... it's Hello. Uh, hi, Alan. Um, you were talking about the detector and all the lens that you guys went through to trying to shield it from, from existing radiation. Yep. Um, but there's known particles that have very little interaction and also maybe there's still some contamination that goes through. What level of confidence you guys got that, you know, when you see the crystal lit up, there's no neutrinos or contamination of somebody yeah. eating a banana? Yeah, no, great. Okay, so one of the, um, I might just go back a slide or two. Um, so one of the reasons uh, we put it in a big tank, uh, where's the tank? These aren't our experiments, by the way. We, we don't use the steel from um, sunken ships. <laughs> um, we have a, well, I'm not going to say better. We have another way of, of removing. We still take preci precision, um, clean and low radiation uh, sources of materials, we, we worry about that stuff, but we suspend these crystals in a, um, a tank of uh, fluid that also flashes when struck by a particle. This is a scintillator, a uh, scintillating liquid, um, LAV or, or pseudocamina, and, the, and we watch that with these precise cameras as well. The idea being that, say, um, <laughs> Say someone had a banana, and the potassium-40 on that banana uh, spat out uh, an energetic particle, that the, we would get essentially a flash of light from the tank and then a flash of light from the crystal. Now, dark matter, as I said, you've been struck once. 
maybe by this point twice, all of you combined in this length of time. The chances that you would get that flash and then the next flash in that amount of time is absolutely vanishingly small. In other words, if we see a double flash, we know that it can't be dark matter. It just collides far too rarely. It's got to be something else. It's fascinating, by the way, what it could be. But uh, that's not true for neutrinos. So neutrinos are the ultimate in ghost-like particles. They were discovered before dark matter uh, and awarded a Nobel Prize for the discovery a few decades ago because there's just so many of them. It is absolutely um, stunning the number of high energy neutrinos. Um, and there's even more low energy ones. And we are building detectors that are getting close to seeing the neutrinos that come from the sun itself. So fusion produces countless um, uh, neutrinos. Eventually, and I mean this in the next 10 years, detectors will become large enough, dark matter detectors will become large enough that they will see those neutrinos. And a neutrino can travel through a light year of lead without colliding on average. A kilometer of rock ain't going to do anything. We will be blinded by the sun, by the particles it produces, even at the bottom of a cave, the bottom of a gold mine. At that point, we need different technologies. Directional. You know where the sun is, so just don't look in that direction, right? Or veto anything that comes from that direction. So there's ways around it. It's a project called Cygnus. But yeah, we, we build these things cleverly, as in, I say we, it's not me. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it's real serious nuclear engineers building this. Um, and we have hopes that with this active veto system, we can actually uh, dig in and, and remove enough of those sources of radiation that we could actually reveal the dark matter, or at least rule out the current claim detection, because there, one group has claimed for a number of years that they've seen it. No one else has, and we're the only ones who can independently check, verify that. Could I, oh, by the way, could I get potentially any younger audience members or women asking a question? That would be great. But yeah, okay, we'll, we'll start with someone who's on the opposite of all of that <laughs> diversity request. Cool. Uh, my question is, um, when neutrinos, my understanding is that um, when they're above a certain energy, you can detect them. But when they're below a certain energy, you can't detect them. Mm -hmm. uh, so could dark matter be uh, these cold neutrinos? Oh, wonderful, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so one of the leading uh, candidates for dark matter could be neutrinos, sterile neutrinos, is a new, new um, uh, type fourth sector neutrino, and it could be that. Um, we wouldn't see it if it was with this detector. You need another type. Uh, we, in fact, there's a, a potential range of, of options for the dark matter candidate, which goes from something the mass of a virus, an actual living organism, living, whatever, um, all the way down to neutrinos or even lower mass. This is something of the order of um, 30 uh, zeros in, in across the mass range. At the newly established um, ARC Center of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics, we are exploring a number of detector technologies that cover that mass range. And hopefully, in the seven years of its existence, which starts this year, we will see it in one of those detectors. So we're spreading. It's not just SABRE. We have a number of others that, that work on different mass ranges. And hopefully, one of them will reveal the dark matter. But there's a lot of gaps across 30 orders of magnitude, if you have just five. Um, this would go from anything that's about uh, a few times the mass of the proton to a couple of hundred at a push. So mostly atomic um, scales. This is called a weakly interacting massive particle. This candidate is called a WIMP. And there's super WIMPs and other WIMPs and other things. Yeah. Yes? It should be on, I'll just. Um, my question is, let's say you find a piece of dark matter. Yep. What, um, to make it, true, so to speak, you know, the repeatability of it, mm -hmm. how, what would, how long would it be to expect to find another piece of dark matter? Right, another collision. Yeah, so you can uh, do the numbers. Uh, one of my students, uh, Grace Lawrence, as her PhD, is working on this. Um, you might expect something uh, 
like a, like a saber scale detector to catch perhaps one a day, maybe, maybe one a week. Um, the problem is you're seeing you know, hundreds, many more per day of these, these other events. So the key is the fluctuation. So you look every day, and what you're trying to do is see if you catch that what was called the annual modulation. So in the winter, sorry, in the summer for the Northern Hemisphere, our winter, the signal is most because the wind is greatest because the Earth is moving in the same direction as the sun through that cloud of dark matter. And then six months later, we should see a minimum. And that variation is about you know, 10 times less than the actual um, number of signals. So you, you're really, it's a tremendously careful experiment that has to be performed. The saving grace is you just wait another year, and you should see the same, and the same, and the same. Um, and, and the dam experiment has run for basically a decade and seen that curve. So they're very confident in what they've seen. It's just that no one else can see it. It's getting a bit awkward. We're, we're the only experiment that gives that independent verification because either we see it, which, in which case, you know, Nobel Prize is galore, or we don't. And then they've seen something else, which is fascinating to describe and understand, but not wouldn't be dark matter. Um, but yeah, you have to wait for a while. But as I said, the, o the thing that gives us confidence is that we understand the Earth's motion around the sun very well, so we can be very confident about what the expected dark matter wind should be is kind of helpful when it's, you don't know what it is. Yes? How do you know that your detector will be able to measure the dark matter? Like, if you don't know what energy it's at, and yep. you've, you've picked a material, but how do you know it's going to absorb it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, yeah, that's the question. Um, <laughs> well, you don't. I mean, you have, it's not to be too trite, but that's why it's an experiment. We're at the frontiers. We are, we are stumbling in the dark. We have some guidance, ideas from theory. Um, but essentially, there's as many ideas for dark matter as there are theorists who come up with them. Because if you happen to get one, be lucky enough to be right, then it's a Nobel Prize for you, right? So everyone comes up with their own idea. We have confidence that the, um, the dark matter is, well, I, I'm personally very confident uh, in this candidate, uh, I like the exploration of the primordial black holes idea, because black holes are known to exist, so that's one up on its favor, but anyways. Um, but yeah, this idea that it could be uh, a particle is about 100 times the mass of the proton, and that's because essentially when the universe formed, uh, it's very, very energetic, there was just energy, and we know from E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous formula, that energy turns into mass. So the very early universe, dark matter and anti-dark matter must have been forming in these pairs. And depending, and basically, as the universe expands, it cools, it drops its energy. Eventually, it will reach an energy that is now too low to produce any more dark matter, anti-dark uh, matter pairs. So you're, that's it. That's the most you'll ever get. And the bigger the mass of the dark matter, the earlier in the universe's history that occurs, the higher energy you need to form it. So essentially, you can you know, crudely shuffle around the um, mass of the dark matter particle and then read off how much of it should be left, or at least a maximal amount of that should be in our universe. And it just so happens 100 times the mass of a proton just gets you about five times more dark matter than there are atoms. It's called the Wimp Miracle. Um, that's a totally in <laughs> quotations of Wimp Miracle. So it's not. It's a good starting place. Let's just put it at that. But you're absolutely right. And that's, that's why at the Center um, uh, for Dark Matter Particle Physics, we're, we've got five detectors that cover that mass range. But there are gaps between them. Nature could be kind. Nature could be cruel. Cool. We'll see. Oh, right. Yes. Hey. Sorry. I was looking at this guy. Yeah. Uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared. Yep. Uh, can you use that or derive anything from that uh, for dark matter and dark energy? Um, yeah, so definitely, uh, so the, the equals mc squared formula, a uh, slight, slight modification of that, that gives you, as I said, an idea of um, the energy that would be produced if dark matter was, say, its own antiparticle. So we have particles, we have matter, we have antimatter. Most people have heard of that, yep. And basically, when a matter-antimatter meets, 
they annihilate in a flash of energy. An electron, its anti-matter uh, equivalent is a positive version. It's called a positron. And when they meet, they flash in an amount of energy that is um, their two times their, their mass energies, because it was one electron, one positron. So we could go looking for dark matter that was annihilating. That mass turned into energy at a specific energy that reflects its mass. Right? So this is a project using um, the Fermi telescope, as well as the NASA's Fermi telescope, uh, amongst others, which looks for gamma radiation. Because this, if this is 100 times the mass of proton, it's extremely energetic when it emits radiation, if all of that mass turns to energy. And we're, what we're looking for is a glow on the sky in gamma rays coming from an otherwise invisible source. There's just some clump of dark matter there, happens to be meeting its own antiparticle, annihilating, shining light in gamma rays. That's, that would be a signal. Um, we've never definitively seen that. And, and I um, have another PhD student working on that idea. But uh, I don't know its energy range. But um, look, if you're. If you've got anything that's sensitive to X-rays or gamma rays, you're going to have a punt. Because maybe it's emitting an X-ray, right? You don't know. Because you don't know what the mass... The, the lower the mass, the lower the energy of the radiation, which could then be in the X-ray band, right? It's more about knowing it's the precise energy that is actually coming out. If it's a spectral signature, then, then you're in business. Um, okay. Right, there was a question. At the... oh, we have two more. Time for two more questions. There's one okay. here. So what happens if the measurement discrepancy turns out to be a seasonal change or like neutrinos from the sun or something? When, when, do, you kind of stop, um, when do you kind of stop looking for WIMPs? Okay, so if, if we've just shown that the gamma signal, you know, three years from now, three, four years from now, we should have enough statistics to know. If, if, if it's true, we should have seen it by them. So we can rule it out at that point. Then we've done the community enormous favor, because that just shuts that down as an avenue. It could be still a wimp, but just even more ghost-like. Collides even more rarely than you know, we, we um, had anticipated. And that has been the case. Every experiment has just put an upper limit to how ghost-like this particle is. So if we don't see it, uh, we keep looking for longer. You build bigger detectors. So they're more sensitive, so you push down until then you hit the solar floor and then you have to use a new technology. And you keep doing this. Because in all other branches of physics, they didn't stop. It's because it got hard, right? You could explore other options and certainly other candidates, axions for example, might be more compelling if we don't see anything from the wimps in this generation or the next. It's more about the focus that you put. And, and physics is always... Um, it's always moving to explore new frontiers and double-checking existing results. And just because one detector says that it hasn't seen it doesn't mean no one's going to check that result. Right? Yeah? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, right, I see. Um, yeah, so for our experiment, say you, it, it's... Um, so the reason it's not, it's not a hard limit, but you just have diminishing sensitivity, is familiar to anyone who's played um, snooker, billiards, whatever. And that is, the collision that we're modeling here is the dark matter comes in, great speed, hits the atom, the nucleus of, of the atom, and off it sends, recoiling, right? It's just a game of billiards. Now, instead of doing similar mass snooker balls, I want you to do the same experiment, but now where the, um, your billiard ball, your target, your atom, very heavy, is struck by something very light. Say, a ping pong ball. That's the very light dark matter. See how much that moves when you collide it. In other words, and you can flip it around the other way, by the way. If this is very, very massive, something like a, you know, some basketball or a bowling ball, and you hit it, yeah, your atom will move, but hardly any of the energy has gone into it. It's just both carried away. You, it's not like you, you know, the, the um, bowling ball suddenly recoils off. Very little energy is transferred. So again, you're not sensitive to very heavy things either. So you've got this little sweet spot where you're close in mass to the thing that's hitting you. And that means that if you want to look for a different mass range, 
then you build from a different material. But sooner or later, you run out of elements. Then you have to do different types of experiments, very clever um, solid state physics, where you use camera, quite literally, the, the charged circuitry of your camera to look. You, it is unbelievable how clever these people are getting in looking for dark matter. And you have to be, because you're really, <laughs> you're looking for a ghost. And, you know, I heard Dan Aykroyd's back for Ghostbusters 4. Um, maybe you can help us on this, I don't know. But it's definitely at the frontiers of not just astronomy, particle physics, theoretical works. It's also at the frontiers of engineering, which is what makes it so exciting to be a part of. So hopefully one or two of you in this audience have thought, that sounds kind of neat. I want to get involved. Maybe someone at NASA wants to fund something. That'd be sweet. <laughs> Cheers, Jim. OK, we have time All for right. one more question up here. Uh, so, so you mentioned that, you, that dark matter might be primordial black holes. Would we be expecting primordial black holes to be to have a very short lifespan and emit observable energy when it decays? Good. Yes, so <clears throat> um, Stephen Hawking, along with predicting that these primordial black holes may be there, very, so this is very low mass black holes, but something saying the mass of an asteroid be the size of an atom. Even the Earth itself crushed to the scale needed to become a, to be dense enough to have a sufficient gravity um, to form a black hole, sufficient gravity that not even light can escape we'd be about the size of, an, of a marble. So these things are very small. Um, the smaller you get, the more, um, uh, the quicker you lose your mass through Hawking radiation. I, I really don't want to get into explaining that, but essentially things can escape a black hole, and the smaller you are, the easier it is to escape in, in some hand-waving way. That Hawking radiation is a runaway effect because you've, you've lost mass, you've gotten smaller, so now you lose even more mass more quickly, and, and so on and so forth. And at the very end of your life, all of the remaining material just suddenly bursts out in this runaway process, and, and you get this big um, uh, uh, burst of, of energy and particles. And this is a, a signal of this was searched for by an, a young Australian radio engineer, John O'Sullivan, because um, Hawking told him it was there. He went looking, and he upgraded his equipment, his radio telescopes, so beautifully precise, and, and find nothing. But the upgrades are the protocol that makes Wi-Fi work. And the CSRO held the patent on that. So CSRO got very rich indeed because we all use Wi-Fi from that one-off royalties. So we didn't find black holes then, but we did get Wi-Fi now. So yeah, I, I'll take that. That's fine. But if you're a little bit bigger, say, say you are the, the case of the Earth mass black hole, then you haven't reach that runaway point yet. You're still, you're glowing, you're losing particles, but you've got billions of years before you really evaporate away. So it means that the total amount of dark matter might be going on, but just infinitesimally slowly. So it means there's a sweet spot. And by the way, if you were much larger, we would have seen it already in, in experiments called the Macho Project and others. So there's a sweet spot, essentially, um, that we haven't looked at before, that we're busy searching at the moment in this project, which is led by, by Jeremy Mould and Ken Freeman. And we're looking at the stars changing every 20 seconds. We've looked over the course of minutes, and nothing's changed, now we're 20 seconds, maybe we may even go shorter, because that just allows you to look at something that's even smaller mass passing between you and that star, and magnifying its light like a magnifying glass. So, it's a beautifully simple concept. Um, what they don't tell you is that everything varies when you look that quickly at the night sky. As a theorist, I was disappointed to discover that because that made my interpretation harder. But the idea is, is beguilingly simple. And it's, there's this sweet spot between black holes we should already have seen in terms of mass, ones that would have evaporated by now, and there's a little sweet spot where it still could exist and could be the dark matter. And if, well, I'll let, oh, maybe I'll come back next year and tell you if we find it. OK, that's uh, all the questions we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, just um, just uh, join me now in thanking uh, Professor Alan Duffy for a very interesting <laughs> Thank you. I'll give it up. Uh, maybe we'll write again. Ah, sorry.
Um, these types of events wouldn't be possible uh, without the generous support from all of our sponsors. Uh, and in particular tonight, I acknowledge the support of the Hawke Centre in making the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery available for this event. Uh, so now, it only remains for me to thank you all for coming tonight to the event. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. This is uh, the last of our public events for this year's SHSSP. And for our participants and special guests, there will be some wine and nibbles. I should go through the second page of scholarships while I'm doing that. Um, upstairs in the Kerry Packer Gallery. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed your evening. <laughs>